here. So we need to talk about how inverse functions uh, react and interact with derivative. So then specifically, just to remind you of the jargon we were talking about last time, we were talking about, uh, you know, given a function, you can have a left inverse of a function, you can have a right inverse of a function. So if g is both a left and a right inverse of f, then you just say without an adjective, you say g is, a, is an inverse of f. So then furthermore, if g is an inverse of f, then f is an inverse of g, right? So then just to sort of, I don't know, pique your interest maybe if it's possible, how about this function, f of x is 1 over x? What is its inverse? So, what does it mean graphically? What does it mean to compute an inverse? Reflection across y is x, right? So then to, to compute, remember the algebraic procedure to compute an inverse, if an inverse exists, is to say, okay, I will consider the graph, right? So this thing right here, this is a representation of the function. Right, algebraically. This thing is a representation of the graph. Okay, so then uh, <coughs> to compute an inverse, algebraically, what do you do? You, you switch x and y. So then this is now x is 1 over y. So now we need to solve for y. And if you solve for y, then what do you get? y is 1 over x. Oh, that's interesting, right? So then what is f inverse? f inverse of x is what? 1 over x. But what is f? Also 1 over x. So that's interesting, right? That should be interesting to you. So now here we have a function that is its own inverse. Right, so f of x is 1 over x is its own inverse. It doesn't make, it's not a big deal in this class, but if you go on into uh, higher math classes or physics classes, mathematical physics classes, then such functions will be important in various contexts. Such a function is called an involution. Okay, so if a function is its own inverse, then it's an involution. So. Can anyone think of another function that is an involution? So what was it? Ah, right, the trivial function. Okay, that one is an involution. F of x is x. <laughs> right? So then you would say y is x, and then you switch x and y so that x is y, and then you solve for y, and then y is x. Right, so f of x is x, that's an involution. Okay, so now I've produced for you two different functions, both of which are involutions, so you can probably imagine that there's a lot of such functions that are involutions. Okay, great. <coughs> so, any question about this? Right, right. So then let's, let's do that. Right, so then this means f of x is x is an involution. Okay, so then let's just try the one that you said. So f of x is x squared. So first off, f of x is x squared, if you were to look at its graph, has this appearance. Okay, it looks like so. So then this is a perfectly legitimate function, is it, a, is it an invertible function? No, it's not invertible. You can see that it is not invertible because it does not pass the, what? Horizontal line test. Right, so for example, this, this horizontal line, this horizontal line crosses the graph in two places. So that graph does not correspond to the graph of an invertible function because, because if you were to take this graph if you were to take that graph 
and then reflect it across the line y is x, then you would obtain this graph, a graph that looks like so. Okay, so then now this, the blue part, no, this one, that one. The blue part gets reflected to something that looks like this. Okay, the red line is a horizontal line. When you reflect it across y is x, what does a horizontal line become? A vertical line. Okay, so you can see that you know, is this the graph of a function? No, because it doesn't pass the vertical line test. Right? So then its inversion is not an invertible function because the inversion doesn't pass the horizontal line test. Okay, good. So, but at any rate, if I modify, if I modify this definition slightly and say that, okay, I'm going to consider the function f of x is x squared, but only for x uh, greater than or equal to zero, then now, now this is a, is a, is an invertible function because it's only including the right hand side. So now we can compute the inverse by saying that I'll consider the graph y is x squared, but only for positive x's. Okay, now I switch x and y to give x is y squared. Okay, then I'll just switch the order and say y squared is x, and now compute the square root of both sides. Y is uh, x is the square root of x. So why <laughs> don't I have to worry about uh, the, the negative possibility? Why don't I have to worry about it? Because of the domain that I specified. Right? Because of the domain that I specified. So then this, right, this function, or this graph, and this corresponding function, f, f inverse of x, is the square root of x. They are inverses of each other. <clears throat> okay, but you should keep in mind that x squared for any x, x squared for any x does not have an inverse. Doesn't have an inverse. x squared for non negative x, yeah, that has an inverse, and the inverse is the square root function. Okay. So then now, my last question is, is how about this? Is x squared an involution? No, x squared is not an involution. OK, how about the square root of x? Is the square root of x an involution? No, nope, not an involution. OK, an involution is a function that is its own inverse. OK, so any question about these things? <coughs> OK, so then the last thing that we're going to talk about before we move on is uh, derivatives of inverse functions. Derivatives of inverse functions. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so specifically, we're going to consider the function the function h of x is equal to f of g of x. f of g of x. And we're going to try and consider what happens if f and g are inverse functions. So if f and g are inverse functions, then what is h of x? It's just x. So if f and g are inverse, then f of g of x is just x. That is to say that h of x is x. <coughs> OK, so then now I can take the equation that I'm boxing here. I can take that equation and then I can compute the derivative of it. Okay, I can compute the derivative of that equation. Okay, so then the derivative of the right hand side, so first I'll write derivative, so derivative 
of f of g of x. That's the derivative of x. Okay, so then the right-hand side is easy, so I'll write what it is. It's just 1. Okay, so then the left-hand side is the composition of functions. What will you need to compute the derivative of the composition of functions? The chain rule. Right. Maybe it should be called the composition rule, I think, but it's not. Okay, so then the derivative of f evaluated at g of x multiplied by the derivative of g evaluated at x. <coughs> okay, so then now I'm going to solve for the derivative of g. So the derivative of g evaluated at x is equal to is equal to 1 over the derivative of f evaluated at g of x. Okay, of course, this equation, this equation can only be true when what? Or how about this? It's easier for me to ask. When might this equation not be true? If this thing is 0, right? This is, this is only true when the derivative of f evaluated at g of x is non-zero. <clears throat> so I'd like to point something out that's sort of a, a deep connection. So then, now, g, since f and g are inverse functions, now I'm going to rewrite this equation. I'm going to rewrite this equation, but using the f inverse notation. So it's going to look like this. And it's going to look kind of funny. So then f inverse derivative evaluated at x is equal to 1 over the derivative evaluated at f inverse of x. And so it looks a little bit more cluttered when you write it with the f inverse notation. <coughs> but I'd like to point out something that sh that was striking to me when I saw this for the first time. So, we have this notion of computing an inverse, and we want to know how, how it interplays with the derivative. Okay, it was striking to me the first time that I saw this that the derivative of the inverse is the multiplicative inverse of the derivative of the original function. Can you see that? So this is the reciprocal, the multiplicative inverse of the derivative of the original function. So that's, that was very interesting to me the first time I saw it. Right, so then you, that can be seen clearly in this equation. Right, the product of, a func of the derivative of a function and the derivative of its inverse is 1. They are evaluated at different places, right? This one is evaluated at x, and this one is evaluated at g of x. But the product of, of <coughs> the two derivatives is always 1. So I found that very interesting. So any questions about this formula? Any questions about it? OK, so then let's do an example computation. OK, so for example, we're going to say let let f of x be 1 fourth x cubed plus x minus 1. OK. So then the first thing I want you to do, part A, so we did this last time, but I want you to do it again. I want you to show f inverse of x exists. And I want you to do this in the easiest way possible. Show it exists. <clears throat> so one way you can show it exists is by computing it. You can compute the inverse function. But you don't need to do that. It would be better if you did something else. So what? Ah, so something about the derivative. So while I'm computing the derivative, you, you explain to me what it is that I'm going to do with it. 
Ah, right, because the derivative, I can see now that the derivative is greater than or equal to one, which is strictly greater than zero, so that means that the derivative is strictly positive. The derivative is strictly positive, which means what about the function? It's strictly increasing, so f of x strictly increasing. So this tells me that f of x is is uh, one to one, which means f inverse exists. Okay. So, you know, most of the time, if I ask you to show that a function, that the inverse of a function exists, it's either because it's falling into one of two categories. It's either one, very easy to compute the inverse function, or two, very easy to show that the derivative is strictly positive or strictly negative. It's almost always going to fall into one of those two categories. Okay, now second. <coughs> B. <clears throat> what, let's say it like this, evaluate f inverse of x at x is 3. Okay, so this one, this one requires a little bit of just sort of pulling a rabbit out of a hat kind of trick. Hmm. No, so this is not related to derivatives yet. This is just the inverse function. So, <clears throat> let's back up just a little bit. So if y is equal to f of x, right? We already showed, we already showed that the inverse function exists. The inverse function exists. So then we should be able to say that f inverse of y is equal to x. So, in a sense, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find we're trying to find an x value. So find something to plug in to f of x so that we get 3. Right, so then look at the original function. Is there something you can plug in there so that you get 3? <coughs> Can you think of anything? Okay, so I'll narrow it down for you. It's an integer. Two, yeah, two. Okay, good. So then, this is this is why I say this is sort of like pulling a rabbit out of a hat a little bit. So notice that f evaluated at two, well, that's one fourth multiplied by two cubed plus two minus one. So this is one fourth multiplied by eight, which is two plus 2 minus 1, which is 4 minus 1, which is 3. Okay, so then f of 2 is 3, which means that f inverse, let's write it like this, which means that 2 is equal to f inverse of 3, okay, which, which is the answer to the question, right? It said evaluate f inverse at x is 3. So what, so what was the answer to the question? Two. Okay, so this is, I understand that this is sort of a mind-bending question. So then now let's do the next part. <coughs> C. Okay, so then now evaluate, evaluate F inverse derivative of X when x is 3. <clears throat> OK, 
Okay, so then, so then what are we supposed to do? So we just use that formula that's on the previous page, right? That's what we're supposed to do. So the formula on the previous page tells us that F inverse derivative evaluated at 3 should be equal to 1 divided by the derivative of F evaluated at F inverse of 3. Okay, so then now, in the previous part, we determined that F inverse of 3 was what? Was 2. So this should be 1 over the derivative evaluated at 2. So now we need the derivative, so I'll copy that down here. So then it's just higher up on the page. So it was 3 fourths x squared plus 1. <coughs> Okay, so then this will be 1 over, now what do you get if you plug in 2? You get 3 over 4 times 4 is 3, plus 1 is 4, so 1 over 4. <coughs> okay, so any question about this one? Any question about this example? Okay, so then, if I ever ask a question like this, you know, this part, this kind of question sort of hinges on this weird part, and I always give you some kind of really obvious hint on how to solve that part. <coughs> because I don't, I think that this is a course about calculus, not about pulling rabbits out of hats. Okay, so any question about this? Okay, <clears throat> so now we need to move on to a very specific inverse function. Okay, so then specifically, we are now in section 5.3, or no, 5.4, which is called exponential functions. Okay, so the first remark is I want you to remind me, what is the definition of this function? No, that's the derivative of that function. What's its definition? Integral, yes, from 1 to x. 1 over t dt. Good. And this is almost it. We need one more thing which specifies which x's are legal. x greater than 0. Yes. Okay. So, now, another consequence, you know, as a consequence, an immediate consequence of this, the derivative with respect to x of the log of x is what? 1 over x. And because x is positive, because x is positive, because that's a requirement of the log of x, tell me about 1 over x. Also positive, right? It's also positive because of the domain of the log function. So what does that tell me? That tells me that the derivative of the log function is strictly increasing, or is strictly positive, so that the log function itself is strictly increasing, so that the log function is 1 to 1. So what does that tell me about the log function? It has an inverse. Okay. So then, as a consequence, log of x has an inverse function. And that's what this section is about, is the inverse of the log function. This one is the log and the inverse of the log function are of paramount importance <coughs> as far as math and science is concerned. Okay, so it has an inverse. Okay, but rather than call it the inverse of the log function or log inverse or whatever, okay, we're going to call it the exponential function for reasons that will become clear shortly. So if we have that f of x is the log of x, 
This implies that f inverse of x exists because of the previous comment, and we're going to denote this function like so, e to the x. Okay, now, for a moment, okay, this is just going to be notation, right? And that e means who knows what. Okay, it could mean anything. Right now, this is just notation, how we're going to denote the inverse. We're eventually going to see, though, that what is that e? What is that e? It's the natural number. The natural number. Specifically, we defined what e was last week. What, what is e? That's right. It's the number. Okay, remember, log is the area between two fence posts. So you hold the fence post at one fixed, and then you move the, the right fence post, right, 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 until the area accumulated is exactly one. So E is the unique number such that the log of that number is one. So the log of E is one. So that's the natural number. This E is going to be exactly the same, but for a, for a moment, it's just going to be notation. Okay, so then this is IE. Okay, Y is E to the X, if and only if, right, these two algebraic expressions are equivalent, y is e, to the, is e to the x if and only if x is the log of y. Okay, so there's one. And two, I'll say this, that the log of e to the x is what? What's the log of e to the x? It's x. Okay, so that says that log is the left inverse of, of the exponential function. Okay, and the exponential function is the right inverse of log. But in addition to that, right, we must have the other way. That is to say that e of log of x is what? Is x. But of course, this is only true for what kind of x's? Positive x's. <coughs> this one is true. The previous one is true for any x. Okay, so log has an inverse, and its name is the exponential function. Any questions about that? Okay, let's just make sure that algebra that you remember this. So all of these things you should have seen before this class. But let's do an example. So what if I tell you that... For example, 7 is, is equal to e to the 5x plus 2. Okay, I want you to solve for x. Okay, so then the first thing you should do is sort of realize that, well, x is in, the, is in this position inside of the exponential function. I need it to be outside. So how can I get it from outside of the exponential function? Yeah, the log of both sides. So then the log of 7, the log of 7 is equal to 5x plus 2. Okay, so then now I can solve for... I can solve for x and say, you know, for example, the log of 7 minus 2 is 5x. So that x is the log of 7 minus 2 over 5. And that's some fantastic number. I have no idea what it is. This is a perfectly legitimate thing. Please don't plug it into your calculator. I'm not interested in that. Okay, so any questions about this example? <coughs> Okay, good. So now what we need to do, what we need to do is we need to sort of convince you that this, this notation, e to the x, is the exact same function that you knew before, right, that you learned in previous classes. Because in previous classes, they just sort of told you, ah, well, I would do this exponential thing, and here's some facts about it. 
So here we developed calculus, and then we said from this development of calculus, we're defining the log as this integral. We define, we note for you that if this function is, has a positive derivative, then it's strictly increasing, and therefore it's invertible. And so what we've said is we said the exponential function is the inverse of the log function. So I need to prove to you that this really is the exponential function that we've always been talking about. Okay, so then let's go through some of that. <laughs> so first, e to the a multiplied by e to the b. Okay, according to your previous experience, what should this be? e to the a plus b, right? Okay, so this better work. And some, somehow, somehow, we have to do this with uh, logs. We have to sort of appeal to the log definition because that's where everything came from. Okay, <coughs> so then, let's take this equation and say that the left-hand side and consider the log of e to the a multiplied by e to the b. Okay, so at least according to the properties of logs, what can I do with that product? Turn it into a sum. So then that's the log of e to the a plus the log of e to the b. Okay. So then now, furthermore, not using the exponent rule for logs, because this e to the a is not necessarily an exponent. This is just notation. Now we need to use the fact that log and the exponential function are inverses. They're inverses. So then, what is this first expression? It is a. Okay, and the second one is b, right? So to, to go from this line to the next line, I didn't use the exponent, the exponent rule for logs. I used the fact that the log and the exponential function are inverses. Okay, so then now I have this equation, the log of e to the a times e to the b is a plus b. And now again, again I'm going to use the fact that log and exponential function are inverses. So then I'm going to compute e to the log of e to the a times e to the b, the exponential of both sides. Okay, now the, the exponential function and log are inverses, so what is the left-hand side now? So how do I rewrite this expression? e to the a times e to the b. Okay, so then this is equal to e to the a plus b. Okay, so then that's what we wanted to show. And I'd like to point out that, that I know that you have this previous knowledge from other classes that the log and the exponential function are related, but I didn't use any of that information to arrive at this conclusion. Okay, I only use the fact that they're formally inverse functions of each other. Okay, so then now, the next one I'm not going to do <laughs> because it's exactly the same. Okay, you just change some pluses to minuses. According to your previous experience, what should e to the a divided by e to the b be equal to? e to the a minus b. Okay, this is exactly the same as the, as the previous one except some pluses are changed to minuses. Okay, so any questions about it? <coughs> okay, so then now we need to have some quick properties of the exponential function. And then we can get to calculus, right? Because we haven't done any calculus yet. Right now we've just said that the only bit of calculus that we used was the fact that the, was the integral definition of the log function and the fact that a positive derivative implies the existence of an inverse. Okay. So, the domain, so the first property is that the domain of f of x is e to the x. So what is the domain of the exponential function? So what, from your prior experience, what can you plug into the, the exponential function? 
Okay, you can plug in any positive x. What about negative x's? Yeah, you can plug them in too. So what about, uh, what is the other possibility? Zero, can you plug in zero? Yeah, so what can you plug in? Anything at all, right? Anything at all, okay, and this is because, this is because the range of the log function is negative infinity to infinity. Right, so remember that the domain and range of inverse functions are swapped. Okay, so similarly to the range of f of x is e to the x is what? What is the range? Zero to infinity. Zero to infinity. So anything positive. And this is because, because of what analogous statement? Right, because the domain of log of x is 0 to infinity. <coughs> OK? So any question about, about these properties? Okay, so just as a matter of graphical intuition, okay, so I'm going to draw the log function. The log function looks like this. Oop. This one. I don't want black either. I want blue. So this is what log looks like. Okay, so if that's what log looks like, now we need to figure out what the inverse of log looks like, the exponential map. Okay, so then what does the exponential map look like? So what will it look like? Reflection across y is x, I agree. Okay, so it's going to look something like this. And it goes up quite rapidly. Okay, some important points that I'd like to point out <laughs> is how about this? Where does the log, where is log zero? So what is this point right here? All right, this is one zero. So that's because the log of one is equal to zero. Okay, so then the analogous point on the exponential map is here. What is this point? Zero one, right? Because remember that inversion is reflection across y is x. So that means that points Right? X, Y points are just, their coordinates are swapped. So this is the point zero, 1. Okay, so that tells you something that's important. What is e to the 0? 1. <coughs> e to the 0 is 1. And then, right, and then if I choose some, some x value, right, some, if I choose the y value, y is 1, right, if this is y is 1, then there's a place where the log function intersects that. What is this point where the log function is 1? E, right? So this is the point E1. Okay, so the corresponding point on the exponential map is here-ish. I'll just sort of eyeball it right there. Okay, so then what is this point? 1E, and this is like so. So this is the point 1, E. Good. So then this is, I'll, I'll say that this observation is enough to, to 
indicate to you that this e that I'm talking about is not just notation, right? I'm not just saying e to the x because that's a nice way to say something. I'm saying e to the x because, because that e is the same e that we're talking about. Okay. So this is saying that e to the 1 is e. Right? So the exponential map of 1 is the number e that we were talking about with respect to log. Okay, good. So any questions about these properties of the exponential function? <coughs> okay, so now, now we get to do the interesting stuff. Okay, so this is specifically uh, the calculus of the, of the exponential function. So here is something that is just unbelievable, right? Maybe not if this is not the first time you're seeing this, but if this is the first time you're seeing this, this should be really surprising. So the derivative of e to the x is, is what? e to the x, can you believe that? That is unreal. Okay, so the derivative of this function, it is its own derivative. Right, so then, you know, it doesn't work with, for example, x squared. The derivative of x squared is 2x, and those aren't the same. The derivative of sine is cosine, similar, but not the same. But the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. That's fantastic. So then the second thing is that assuming the first thing is true, assuming the first thing is true, and we'll show that it's true in just a minute, the derivative with respect to x of e to the u, right, this is, this is the interaction of the chain rule with the exponential derivative. Okay, it will be e to the u, and then for the chain rule, multiplied by du dx. Okay, so then, let's show that this is in fact the case. <coughs> it starts out with this. The log of e to the x. Right, the log of e to the x. Well, that's just a fancy way to write what? x. Right, that's just a fancy way to write x. Okay, then I can use, I can compute the derivative of both sides of this equation. Okay, so then let's do that. The derivative of the log of e to the x should be equal to, well, the derivative of x is 1. Okay, so then now to compute the derivative of the left-hand side, I'll use the chain rule. The chain rule says that this should be 1 over e to the x multiplied by the derivative of e to the x. And that should be equal to 1. So now I can solve for the derivative of e to the x. Right? The derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Unbelievable. So then you can multiply both sides by e to the x because it is a fact that e to the x is positive. We don't, have to have, we don't ever have to worry about it being 0. So that's interesting. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Okay, so let's do an example. <coughs> Computation. So how about the derivative of e to the, say, x squared? So what is the derivative? So it's e to the x squared, but that's not all multiplied by the derivative of x squared. The multiplication by derivative of x squared is the action of the chain rule. So this is e to the x squared multiplied by 2x. Okay. So then I always get a student ask and say, can I write the 2x on the left side? I prefer to write it on the left side. I don't care. Okay. Write it on the left side. I have a, a pretty strong habit of writing it on the right side because in other contexts, in more advanced math classes, it does actually matter what side you write it on. And in that case, the right side is the correct side. In this class, it doesn't matter what side you write it on. Left, right, doesn't matter. Okay, but in other classes, it does matter. So in this class, do whatever you want. Okay, so then how about, how about the derivative of, say, mm, the sine of 2x multiplied by e to the 5x. <coughs> yeah.
Yeah, so we'll need to use the product rule. That's the purpose of this example, to remind you that such a thing exists, right? The product rule. Okay, so then the derivative of the sine of 2x is cosine of 2x multiplied by 2, and then e to the 5x. So that's the derivative of the sine thing multiplied by the exponential thing, then plus sine of 2x multiplied by the derivative of e to the 5x. So the derivative of e to the 5x is e to the 5x, and then what? T multiplied by 5. <coughs> okay, so any question about this example? Okay, so then now, um, how about, what time is it? We're almost out of time. Okay, so then we have time for two more. The derivative of, say, something like, e to the, e to the what? e to the x squared plus x plus 7. Okay, so since I'm, I'm in a hurry, I'll just go ahead and write down the answer. So e to the x squared plus x plus 7 multiplied by the derivative of x squared plus x plus 7, which is 2x plus 1. <coughs> okay, so then now from this I can say that, well, if I give you the function e to the x squared plus x plus 7, then we just got finished saying that the derivative of that function is e to the x squared plus x plus 7 multiplied by 2x plus 1. So then now, I want you to find the critical numbers. Okay, so the critical numbers of a function are where the derivative is what or what? Undefined or zero. So then now, consider the derivative. Is there anywhere the derivative is undefined? No, because the exponential function is defined everywhere, and 2x plus 1 is defined everywhere. So are there any critical numbers in the undefined category? No, there are none in that category for this function. Is there anywhere the derivative is zero? Yes, so then let's solve that real quick. So that if we want to solve the derivative is zero, so the derivative is the product of two things. So then, so then what this is saying is that e to the x squared plus x plus 7 is zero, or 2x plus 1 is zero. So 2x plus 1 is zero, that's easy, so I'll solve that first. So this is x is negative 1 half. How about solutions to this equation? So what if you were to compute, attempt to compute the natural log of both sides? So what is the natural log of 0? It's not defined. OK, alternatively, what is the range of the exponential function? Greater than 0. Right, so this is an equation. Just because you write an equation down doesn't mean it has a solution. Are there any solutions to this equation? No, there aren't any. There are no solutions to this equation, none. Because e to the u is positive for any u. OK, the final example that I want to say is this one. So then now, if x is constant, with respect to t, then I want you to compute the following. If x is some symbol that is constant with respect to t, then what is the derivative with respect to t of e to the x? It's 0. It's zero, okay? Because you know it's you could write it like this: it's e to the x multiplied by dx dt. But if x is constant with respect to t, then dx dt is zero, so this is all just zero. And this is the subject of a short joke that I will leave you with. Okay, so <laughs> the exponential function and a constant are walking down the sidewalk. And they're walking down the sidewalk. And all of a sudden, the, the constant function screams out, and Tara says, oh, no, I see the derivative operator over there. 
and why is the why is the constant function so terrified of the derivative? Because the derivative of a constant function is zero. And so the exponential function says, just stay with me, I'll take care of this. And the exponential function walks right up to the derivative and says, it's nice to meet you, I'm e to the x. And the derivative says, it's nice to meet you too, I'm ddt. <laughs> Isn't that great? You should tell that to your family members. <laughs> okay, see you on Friday. <coughs> Yes, there will be homework. <laughs>